Well, hello everyone, welcome. I'm John Mead from A16 and on uh, behalf of uh, Helix Brewing and A16, I want to welcome you. Thank you for, for being here for this special event. How many of you have been to a Wild Wednesday before? First of all, I want to thank the folks at Helix Brewing uh, for allowing us to have this space on Wednesdays. Um, if you're so inclined to drink craft beer, please please patronize them. They're wonderful people. And Cameron, who is actually in Thailand right now, um, is yeah. an outdoor guy and trail runner. And uh, he uh, he loves having this. In fact, it was his idea to do that. When, we, when A16 closed out, he wanted to, to keep this going. And he thought, well, use my space and uh, put as many Jean as, as you want. So about we've got another one, couple coming up. And uh, we're going to take off the holidays. But then uh, January 31st. We have uh, Keith Ferrara, who is an expert in survival skills. He used to get, do a survival class for us up at our Los Angeles store years ago, and uh, it was very popular. And he's going to come down and do a little two-hour class for people on the 31st of, of January. So put that on your calendar. And then we have uh, Jennifer Redman from uh, um, the I'm pointing at you, Diane, <laughs> Sunbelt Publications. She has written, she's written a book and she's going to come and present to us on Valentine's Day. And we were debating on whether or not that was a good day to do it, but her book is about her honeymoon, um, with, obviously with her husband, uh, on, uh, uh, on a sailboat and going to, to Baja, California. So um, I, I don't know much about other than the book, but it seemed like a bit of a romantic tale. And uh, she's, she's just coming out with it, I think, right now. So. Yes, Diana. I one thing. The yes. Is still on. They never cut off the sale. Oh. <laughs> oh, is that right? But you could squeeze in on the other is that right? side. Oh, yeah. Well, well, I guess it worked. <laughs> anyway, so we thought, you know, or this is perfect for, for uh, Valentine's Day. So make your date now to come on the 14th. <clears throat> I think it's the 14th this year of February. <laughs> so um, two people I'd like to introduce uh, to you um, from A16. A16, as you know, is uh, uh, just a... A miniature of what it used to be but uh, we do these events and we sell you know some products online just to have fun and to get to inspire people and and have you know have fun keeping the brand uh, alive and in and, and, and remembrance um, but with a16 the new a16 and one of the biggest things that we do is, is these events uh, on Wednesdays not Mondays um, and what I we have about oh, we have some trail angels I call them and these are people who uh, have, have, have some affiliation with A16 and to volunteer their time uh, to do some amazing things. And there's two people here tonight that are what I, A16 Trail Angels. And one of them is Mike Moriarty. Moriarty. Mike <laughs> is working on a documentary about Adventure 16. And he also, you know, when we were doing these events, he said, let's film them and put them on, you know, YouTube so the rest of the world can uh, see, you know, see what we're up to. Uh, and see what San Diego outdoor community is doing. So Mike has been filming these, and so if, if, you, if you don't pay real close attention to what Dave has to say tonight, you can go back in a couple weeks, and uh, it'll be posted on the A16 YouTube site. Um, so and Mike has his own company, uh, Pine Media. So that's uh, that's his company, and thank you for volunteering your time to do this. And just such a pro. Um, thank you. And we've just signed up tonight. Uh, an A16er, uh, Hilda uh, Babrick, Bab Babic. Babic, Babic, thank you, sorry, yeah, I always called you Rodriguez right? <laughs> back oh, yeah. in the old days. Uh, Hilda worked at A16 back uh, when she was Rodriguez. <laughs> and, um, anyway, um, and now she's married to Greg. Uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, and, and they have been trail angels of A16 for many years, even though she left A16 23 years, 23 years ago. <laughs> she worked with us for 12 years. And she now has uh, volunteered to be my backup. So if I can't be here for a, a wild Wednesday, uh, whether it's Wednesday or Monday, she's going to step up and help the presenter, you know, get things in line, set the chairs up, and, and, and make, things, make things happen. So thank you, Hilda, for being at A16 Trail Angels, and, and Greg, too, her lovely assistant. <laughs> but we have a very special person that I would like to introduce to you tonight that... Uh, um, I, I heard just a few days ago that he was going to be able to make it, uh, and that's Rob Haskell. Ha Rob is the CEO and president of the uh, San Diego River Park Foundation. Have anyone here heard about the San Diego River Park Foundation? So yeah. probably half the people. So 
Okay, you, most people have already heard, so you probably don't need to <laughs> chat. Anyway, this seemed like the perfect partnership. Uh, we would like to, at every one of our events, you know, have some nonprofit that, that we have affiliation with come and talk. And so this is the first time we've been able to do that. And uh, Dave, or <laughs> Rob's going to talk to you just for a few minutes about uh, his organization. And I just want to, before you jump up here, I uh, just want to uh, thank you for all the work that you guys have done. It's uh, the organizations, I think it's been around about 30 years now. Is, am I right on that? It feels like 30, 23. <laughs> 23, yeah, but it looks like 30. But they got, the, they, thank you. They are really responsible for uh, keeping, or helping to keep the San Diego River looking like the Los Angeles River, which is more like a canal. So I'm not going to go into that whole story other than just it's a it's a huge, uh, a huge work that they're doing and so appreciated. And I am delighted to be able to have you come and just speak with us for a bit about your organization. Thank you, Robert. If, if you didn't realize, if you would have raised right here, this water drains into the San Diego River. But they didn't realize that. Most people know. Alvarado Creek is kind of back here somewhere, and it, the streets collect the water and eventually drains toward Mission Valley. Um, we got started on Alvarado Creek. That's why it was kind of cool when Dave and, and John got together with me to kind of invite us to be here. And we're so appreciative. Um, 23 years ago, almost to the day, more or less, no, not even close, actually. 23 and a half years ago, um, there was a huge sewer spill. 34 million gallons of raw, nasty, untreated sewage, the biggest sewer spill in the state's history, happened on Autorotic Creek. Now, 34 million gallons is a lot of sewage, right? But you know what was really bad about that? It wasn't just the sewage. It was the fact that nobody seemed to care. Nobody seemed to notice. And so we, as people that grew up in San Diego and love San Diego, were like, how come? How come where San Diego was founded, where native peoples have lived for 10,000 years, when a sewer spill of this size, this magnitude happened, how come nobody got upset? Nobody got pissed off, nobody took action. And so about five of us got together and formed an organization to give the river a voice and a better future. And so that's the San Diego River Park Foundation. We're a local nonprofit. We've been at it for 20, 22, 23 years now, which is hard to believe, I can't believe it. I have the most awesome of jobs. Like one day I'm like sitting trying to buy land and the next day I'm trying to pick up trash and the next day I'm talking to the mayor or yelling at the mayor about of some city about homelessness and, and all of these different issues and it's all about the San Diego River. And, and Dave and I were talking briefly and he reminded me something I think about almost every day which rivers are about community. They bring people together. And how come the San Diego River wasn't doing it? And that's what we set up to change. So it was really us. great to see so many of you raise your hands and say, yeah, I know what the Santa River Park Foundation is, who they are, and what they do. A lot of people don't realize it starts all the way up in the mountains by Julian. So when you look east, the tallest peak there is Cuyamaca Peak, right? And so everything that drains down into the San Diego River eventually comes here. You all know, because you're outdoor enthusiasts, that the upper part of the San Diego River is just this amazing place. You know, we think of San Diego, it's brown, it's dry, it's rocky, right? And then it rains and the water comes rushing down the river. And then it turns this beautiful green, luscious color. And then the yellow flowers pop out and the gold flowers and the purple flowers and the red flowers. And it's this amazing thing that is our seasonal change. And then it disappears. It really doesn't, though. It's still alive. And we know that in San Diego County, there's more species here than anywhere. There's more species here at risk than anywhere. And so these are the things that we all come together about to try to change. And so with that, I'm really happy to hear um, Dave talk about the Colorado River, the mighty, it says mighty, right? The mighty Colorado. We might be the little mighty San Diego River. Maybe. <laughs> We're not that big, but um, still it's an important part of San Diego. And so I'm really honored to introduce, I get to introduce Dave. And we just met on the phone briefly, and I'm really, really happy to be, that you're here and looking forward to what you say. And, and getting a copy of your book too. So uh, let's hear it for Dave. Thanks everybody. Thank you for your important work. Yeah, yeah we need these places uh, close to home as reference and, uh, and for ownership. And, and so thank you for your very important work. Um, what I have in mind is to take you to the Colorado River and 
take you on a bit of a journey with me. And I've been working on this project for over seven years. I'm not going to stop anytime soon. Uh, just to uh, give you a little background, my first multi-year project was about the Colorado Prairie, which is half of the state of Colorado, the eastern half. Felt like it was underserved and that, um, you know, people think it's drive-through country and it's amazing. And a lot of that work was done very close to home. And if anybody's a photographer, I strongly suggest you work close to home. Um, and that, uh, that a lot of that work was at Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge where bison were returned after a 150-year absence, wild bison. And then, uh, and, and I did the Prairie Project. I was full-time employed in a corporate job. And then I left that job in 2008 and went full-time as a conservation photographer, which I am today. And I went straight into a project about the sagebrush ecosystem and published a book with Braided River, our current publisher, called Sage Spirit, and that story was built largely around the life cycles of sage grouse, both Gunnison and Greater. This is a very endangered Gunnison sage grouse on a private lands ranch lek in collaboration with the State Wildlife Agency. 350 species depend on the sage. By the way, this is in the Colorado River watershed. 350 species, including us. <clears throat> this is kind of what it's like for me in the field. Fancy dirt bag, eating organic groceries out of a Yeti cooler after a morning on a very cold morning on a sage grouse lake. And then this is uh, also what it looks like at the bottom of Black Canyon of the Gunnison, where the river talks. It talks so much that you go, what? What? It's stunning down there. <clears throat> I show this image to say, uh, number one, this watershed is gorgeous from top to bottom. It is stunningly beautiful throughout the Colorado River watershed and very diverse. And this is this thread, this thin line is all we have for 40 million people in the economies of the American West. This city gets about 43% of San Diego's water from the Colorado River through the All-American Canal and the Imperial District. So San Diego, San Diego is significant and the water commutes far, just like many of you do. Um, and we know the story that we hear often is that the river is dying, frankly. That was a big part of my motivation to start this project. I felt like I had more to say that, hey, wait a minute, everywhere I go where water flows, there is life, abundant, dynamic life. And yes, the two big uh, reservoirs, Powell, the second largest reservoir in America, and Mead, the very largest, balancing those two reservoirs is a big task. The river is over allocated or overpromised, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and we have less water in the system. If you live close to the headwaters, as I do, you notice anybody who recreates in the headwaters knows that winter is three weeks shorter on the front end and it's three weeks shorter on the back end. Six full weeks less winter, and that's a big part of the moment that we find ourselves in. So then we go to Lake Mead and we see a similar story. I was there when it was at 26% of capacity a year ago, July, a nice 110 degree day. When I made this image, you can see the bathtub ring around the reservoir. The thing is, is if all we show people are white bathtub rings around reservoirs, nobody's gonna care. And then there's these alarming scenes like a speedboat tipped up on end that was under 150 feet of water. In fact, everything in this frame was under 150 feet of water not very long ago. And about 80% of the river goes to agriculture. Um, frankly, a lot of that goes to feed cows. And uh, agriculture has some of the oldest rights on the river. Massive economies are hitched to agriculture, so you can't just you know, pull the plug on some of these producers. Interestingly, in the upper basin, there's thousands of farmers. In the lower basin, there's about a dozen or something. Big, massive agricultural industrial complexes. 40 million people are hitched to the river, 6 million to the Central Arizona Project or the Cap Canal, which starts at Havasu by Mead and goes through Phoenix, North Phoenix, which is where this frame is, and on to, it terminates just past Tucson, 336 mile canal, 6 million people. Our job, the 40 million of us, is to change our relationship to water. You know, we're not in the rooms renegotiating the Colorado River Compact. 
but it's our relationship that has to change. We can't do things the way we've always done them. And I say that coming from Denver, which is one of the greenest cities you'll ever go to, way too much Kentucky bluegrass, and all that's going to change. We have to change how we see rivers. We have to get into a space where we believe rivers flow through us for there to be meaningful change. And to do that, we're going to have to go to the river. But have you been to the river? And I think conservation should be an invitation. So would you like to go? <clears throat> have you been to the headwaters in Rocky Mountain National Park? I see you back there, <laughs> headwaters lady. <laughs> where the river comes out of the never summer rain, range and it's starting to swell with spring runoff as a storm lifts off of, of the mountains. What's it like to float on the Yampa River in Dinosaur National Monument beneath the Tiger Wall and maybe feel compelled to kiss the wall because river lore says you'll have safe passage through the rapids downstream. It is a little rough on the lips. <laughs> How does it feel to stand next to the Colorado River at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and take in a third of the world's history while contemplating the power and intention and a roar of the river that you can feel in your chest, an intention to reach the sea as it has for six million years? What's it like to float on a river of glass with the red cliffs above reflected and the only sound are bird song and the dipping of your paddle into the water on the Green River in Lab Labyrinth Canyon last month. When we stand in a free-flowing river, the current rippling against our, our thighs, we can feel our legs vibrating, the river is flowing through us. And in that moment, we are connected to all 40 million of us. We're connected to one another and we're connected to all life in this watershed. Why did that advance on its own? We need better stories. We need different narratives. Each of us can carry our own stories. I met with some of you before this, and each of you had interesting stories of where you've been in the watershed. Those are important to share with others. My journey officially started seven and a half years ago. I worked parts of seven years on this story. There was a little thing called a pandemic in there somewhere as well. Um, but my wife Marla and I had been roaming these mountains for decades prior over mountain passes from one watershed to the next. Had a pretty good look of it, at it from the Alpine perspective and backpacking trips in the Grand Canyon and so forth. And then in 2011, we thought we'd climb James Peak on the Continental Divide in between Denver and Winter Park, 13,286 feet. We tried four times that winter. We got blown off each time. On the last day of winter, we made it to the summit. And there we stood up there in the, in the late afternoon, actually. We actually hiked, hiked down in the dark on that trip. But when we stood up there, last day of winter, I looked towards Long's Peak at the top of the horizon across all these ridges, all covered with snow, and I thought, holy cow, this is all the water we have for the coming year. This is it. And when somebody says, you know, where's your water come from? This place is a good reference for you, for all of us. That's what connects each one of us. Our water comes from the same place. What flows to the right will go to the Platte River and Denver and, and on to our friends in Nebraska. What flows to the left will go to the Fraser and the Colorado. Fraser is the first tributary of the Colorado. It's a wonderful place to explore on skis and snowshoes and to go look for white-tailed ptarmigan who are a camouflage specialist that spends their whole life cycle above timberline. And they survive winter by eating little tiny willow buds from alpine willow and they bury themselves in snow or snowpack for insulation. Similarly, <laughs> pika do not hibernate. They gather this huge larder of hay forbs and, and grasses, giant mound of hay that gets all covered up with snow. So you're in talus, which is rocky slopes in the mountains with a pile of hay covered in snow. And the snow insulates the pika so they can survive a rocky mountain winter. In a sense, these animals are 100% dependent on snowpack and so are we. 
There's no separation. And if we go to Winter Park Ski Area, on the lower right part of the frame is a diversion structure with huge pipes. And every crease in the mountains in the headwaters has diversion structures on it. Every creek, every stream gets diverted. There's places where the river or the water crosses underneath the mountains, the same water, three times underneath the Continental Divide. There's an awful lot of diverting going on. And 60% uh, of the Fraser River gets diverted. It gets sent through the Moffat Tunnel. There's a train bore and there's a water bore that was built in 1908. Gets sent through the Moffat Tunnel and joins South Boulder Creek and powers Denver's economy, Denver's lawns and golf courses. Um, so that's a Denver water owned project. And, um, but it's not totally bad news. This is uh, the style we drew our maps in for this story. All of our maps are in this exact same style. We show upper and lower basin per the Colorado River Compact. Upper basin is Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. Lower basin is California, Arizona. Or, or New Mexico is also in the upper basin. California, Arizona, and Nevada in the lower basin, plus the two Mexican states of Sonora and Baja. We show the river reaching the sea, as it did for six million years. Uh, major tributaries, major places in the watershed. And then we show places where water gets pushed out of the watershed. Denver and San Diego are two of those trans basin or trans mountain diversions. <clears throat> this is another way of looking at a watershed. So a watershed is connecting all of the high po points around a river system. And then everything, all the, the moisture that hits those high points flows down into the big river. And if we, as we look at this, <clears throat> this graphic, this is creeks and streams and tributary rivers, all that pulse and rhythm and flow going, all that energy going to the big river. And I like to think of it like a human nervous system or a human heart or mycelium crawling across the forest floor. All, we are made of rhythm and pulse too, right? The river starts humbly. This is midwinter, but in in the summertime, you can go into the headwaters and you can jump across the Colorado River, especially my friend Ben over here. He could step over it. <laughs> we told our story through river keepers, part of it. Kirk Clanky is one of those people. I asked Kirk what's, what, about his relationship to the Fraser River. He lives in Fraser, Colorado by Winter Park. He said, well, you can't stand in a river for 40 years and not have a relationship to it. He also likes to say conservation begins with a conversation. And Kirk is the president of Trout Unlimited Headwaters and he's had this long conversation with Denver Water. It's, it was really ugly for a long period of time and then people started listening to one another. Maybe they figured Kirk wasn't gonna go away. <clears throat> Ultimately, the Fraser River really needed some help. And so they formed a, a, a group called the Learning by Doing Group. And what they're doing is they're working on projects together, Trout Unlimited, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Denver Water, and other entities to improve the health of these headwaters streams. And so in this picture, thank you, point bars were established, the river was dredged so it would be cooler for trout, um, the channels were, 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 were lined and, 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 and defined, and willow was brought in to anchor the stream and to, for the health of, of wildlife. So <clears throat> restored willow is, is there and we went back for a biomass study and um, in this biomass study we had all these different entities in the water together, TU, Denver Water, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, kids, volunteers, shocking fish, catching fish, and there's John Ewart with Colorado Pikes, Parks and Wildlife with a nice brown trout. But what, what the, re, the really big takeaway is there are minnows, there is new fry, so fish are reproducing in this stretch of the river, and there's sculpin, which are really important little fish that uses the interstitial gaps in the, in the riverbed, and uh, that means there's healthy aquatic insect populations too. So super cool. And the birds like the restored willow, like the, the yellow warbler, this guy's singing his head off, or her head off from a, a nesting territory, protecting nesting territories in, in May. If we go upstream, there's 
American Dippers. They're a trout with feathers. They're a, uh, they, they hunt the same prey that trout do. They dive for their prey. They're the only American aquatic so songbird, and they're just super cool animals. This guy just grabbed a, a gob of insect larvae off the so side of a rock. Um, super neat birds. And in the headwaters, fire is an issue. Uh, we had the Big East Troublesome Fire that was almost a conflagration, conflagration with another huge fire in uh, 2020. It was really ugly. It was 90 some degrees in late October in the mountains. The winds were blowing 100 plus miles per hour. We had this enormous firestorm. This is the Colorado River snaking out of the park, going into Sun Valley Ranch Estates, which totally burned to the ground. And then I went back in spring and the forest floor was starting to reclaim and this is monument plant um, sort of returning green to the forest floor. And now it's, it's quite green in those burned spaces. The cool thing or the, the not horrible thing about that fire was it was so intense, so hot, so windy that it burned in patches and left some other patches green. So it wasn't as tragic as it could have been and uh, did not destroy the soil for long periods of time. The Green River starts as rivers of ice in the Wind River Range where four major river systems are born. I think of this range as the, the place where American rivers are, are born. And, uh, and so it starts at Stroud Glacier and then it flows down into Peak Lake and it flows out of the Bridger Wilderness Area, goes through farms and ranch lands and it hits the first dam in the system which is Fontenelle Dam and Fontenelle Reservoir and um, I say first because it's the northernmost in the stair-stepped Colorado River system. And right below there is Seedskitty National Wildlife Refuge, where Tom Kerner is the refuge manager. Tom likes to carry a camera everywhere he goes. He's got the 500 millimeter lens next to him. He makes amazing photographs, and he uses them to be an ambassador for his own refuge. Nobody else is out in this remote place, you know, taking the number of images that he does and does a great job with it. He's a great guy. He likes to do lots of experimental habitat treatments. He's known for that. Um, and uh, Tom, Tom pays attention, he told me when I interviewed him, to ecosystem drivers. What really makes the ecosystem go, you know? And a lot of times, that's the woody vegetation, that you don't have willow and cottonwood below dams, at least not in abundance, because the dams prevent flooding. And so you don't have the spring floods where the river can sprawl out. And these woody uh, plants in, in the riparian zone, they need to have their toes in water for extended periods of time. So you have to replace that willow. And everything eats willow, plus it's structure for birds. And so here Russ is trimming willow to be staked in the, the banks of the Green River. Um, yeah, three, the Seedskadi is named a, after the Shoshone name. It was actually Siskidi Aja, it was kind of bastardized by mountain men to Seedskidi, but what it means is river of the sage grouse. And so on three straight mornings, I watched these sage grouse line up in this exact same spot right before sunrise. And then as soon as the sun crested the eastern horizon, they flew over the river to a wet meadow to feed on insects and forbs. The, cool, <laughs> the kind of wild thing about it was they were right underneath an eagle nest. <laughs> and uh, I guess they evolved together over, over a millennia, so they know what they're doing. Um, there was three hungry chicks there, and then they were getting deliveries pretty regularly of white suckers by one of the adults each time. Pretty cool stuff. Because the, the refuge doesn't, or is below a dam, it doesn't freeze in winter. So there's 36 miles of open river that trumpeter swans use, and it's become a stronghold for trumpeter swans, who almost went extinct in the later 1800s. Now they're doing pretty well. 300 trumpeter swans come here in winter. They're arriving right now from as far away as Alaska. Pretty neat. There was a few collared a couple of years ago, like six birds were collared. Somehow I got lucky and photographed the one on the right, which is collared. And Tom told me the story that a couple of years ago, two of them took off and flew the length of the Colorado River all the way down to the Grand Canyon, two collared trumpeter swans, and came back, and nobody knows why. 
but they connected the, much of the watershed for us. There's river otters, which are clean water indicators, and uh, they eat a lot of fish, and crawdads in particular, lots of crayfish. This guy's eating an America white, American whitefish. Rough-legged hawks come in the winter. They're Arctic breeders, and they like the open sage and prairie um, in the lower 48. Kokanee salmon run upstream and, uh, from Flaming Gorge. And even though they're not native, they don't really do any harm. In fact, what they do do is they drop their eggs and they die. And then they feed the biomass and lots and lots of birds and otters and other creatures feed on the carcasses of these salmon, which are really just a landlocked sockeye, basically. And then there was one trip, those of you that are photographers know what this is like, where I arrived and I met a fisherman and he goes, check this out. And he showed me a picture on his camera that was one of the most amazing, on his iPhone rather, one of the most amazing bobcat pictures I've ever seen. It was framed perfectly in a cave with a perfectly black background. And it was in this area and they told me, you're going to have a hard time getting in there to find it because it was across the river. I figured it out. I got in there and I, spent, I scrapped all my other plans and I spent a week looking for these bobcats <laughs> up and down those buttes. And in that time, I had prairie falcons screeching at me. And shortly after, I realized that they were feeding young on a scrape over the Green River. Um, they were bringing them chipmunks and ground squirrels. Really cool to spend time with them. From river level, I could photograph that, that uh, nest site. Marsh wrens were in the, in the um, wetlands, circling around, protecting their nesting territories. This was in June. And then at the end of the trip, I was tucked in the side canyon, camouflaged, and she appeared right at sunset. I was whispering, it's sunset. Please come now. <laughs> and she did. And after that, three kittens, one by one, three kittens, marched across the edge of the, the canyon rim. I held my breath as I watched this because it was really steep below them, but they're cats. And then later that night as it was getting dark, I watched uh, one of them nurse, um, and, and that was it for the evening. So pretty remarkable. If you go to Bears Ears National Monument, who, who knows Bears Ears? Anybody been to Bears Ears? Quite a few, actually. Um, so southeast Utah, I consider it the cultural and um, spiritual center for indigenous people with ties to this region. And I was invited to go to the 2019 Bears Ears Summer Gathering. And that was the five tribe, tribe coalition of Navajo, Zuni, Hopi, uh, Ute, and Ute Mountain Ute people who didn't used to get along. But they came together for the protection of Bears Ears. And the original mapping of Bears Ears was mapping the vegetation plots of the ancestral Puebloans who, had, who were the original inhabitants of this, of this place. Pretty cool. So in this teepee are elders from the Five Tribe Coalition. And they started chanting, and there was a, a light boom, boom, boom drum beat. And I went to bed finally really late, and I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Boom, boom, boom. The drum beat was still going. They went all night long. Really cool. And we know Bears Ears for the, we don't say ruins anymore, we don't say Anasazi anymore. Those are offensive terms. The people are still here and they have sacred ties to the, this ancestral place. So there's over 100,000 of these cultural sites and artifacts and so forth. It is an extraordinarily rich place and you can find arrowheads and pottery and corn cobs and the whole bit when you explore there. You can go up on Muley Point and see where the San Juan River carved these goosenecks in entrenched meanders with Monument Valley in the backdrop. San Juan is a direct tributary of the Colorado. The Bears Ears Buttes are two sandstone buttes on top of Cedar Mesa. Yes, but again, it's, it's really about the whole region and the people who have ties there and who are more than happy to have it protected and share it with all of us. Pathways led me, led me to Cynthia Wilson, who at the time was the traditional foods coordinator for Utah Denebakea. And uh, she's a nutritionist studying both Western 
and, and uh, Native American ways. Actually, I just had the good fortune of seeing Cynthia at Berkeley, uh, gave a talk in Berkeley, and Elena and I were there, and, uh, and Cynthia's going to school there, earning her PhD, but she's just been really generous and kind and, and welcoming me to me. Um, I'll just say she's in her Hogan here, which is the womb of Mother Earth. It's a sacred building. It's lined with juniper, stripped juniper from bear's ears. Pretty extraordinary to be in there, sharing that space. Ann Castle, during the pandemic, she's the Upper Colorado River Basin Commissioner who is renegotiating the terms of the Colorado River Compact. And during the pandemic, she and her partner, Bitta Becker, who is also a water lawyer, saw an extreme need for clean water for tribal communities because while we were being told to wash our hands for 20 seconds, they don't even have access to water. So Anne drafted me to help her with the um, Clean Water for Tribal Communities initiative. I got the name a little wrong there, but you get the point. And, uh, and it's been a great pleasure working with Anne. And then in tandem working with my friends in Monument Valley. So this is Cynthia's dad, Henry Wilson Sr. And he is at the Monument Valley collection site. If you're indigenous and you live in this part of the world, you need a three quarter ton pickup truck, a 325 gallon tank, and you need to go collect water every day. It takes about a half hour with that silly garden hose to fill the tank. You can see how long the line is. On this day, it was a two and a half hour wait to just get water for the day, and then it has to be distributed. The sprinkler system was uneven, so the water has to be distributed by the people, and water poured in each, on each plant in the traditional foods garden. And then some goes to the sheep, and some goes to the horses, and the people get what's left, but it's got uranium in it, so the people don't drink the water, they have to drink bottled water. We promised these folks a livable homeland, and we gotta get this figured out. You don't have a livable homeland without water. I went back a month later, everybody was happy. We've got knee-high corn now, life is good. The traditional foods garden, you wouldn't think it would grow this much. Great crops in red sand, but um, I think you have to nod, give a nod to the folks that are doing this work. Pretty incredible. <clears throat> Gila River, southwest New Mexico, flows out of the Mugion Range, the Gila and Aldo Leopold Wilderness, uh, the largest contiguous wilderness in the lower 48, was to be dammed in the 1960s. Right here at the current gauge that measures the flow of the river. And I'm with Martha Cooper here. So what happened was the townspeople, the community, from Silver City on to the west to the towns of Gila and Cliff, they're pretty upset. This is a beloved river system. It's one of the most biodiverse places or wildlife rich places in North America. Free flowing river, the only free flowing, flowing river in New Mexico. And the only, pretty, one of two in the Southwest. So they kept pushing back over time and it didn't get dammed. And it was supposed to send 14,000 acre feet to Arizona, which would have been really expensive water. Martha comes along, she works for the Nature Conservancy Nature Conservancy has a farm there that was donated to the Nature Conservancy. With that, they have an irrigation right. And so Martha's going to the meetings and she's working with the irrigators because she too is an irrigator and developing these relationships. And every one of these river keepers is building their own community around saving their part of their river. Folks started to agree on stuff and ultimately they picked the preferred alternative so they still get water for their farms, but there's no dam. And it was stopped in 2020 by Michelle Lujan, the governor of New Mexico. And what a spectacular place this is with that canopy of cottonwoods and free to be flashy as it wants to be and carve new channels every year and it does. It's an explosive, powerful river. In the top of the frame are yellow cottonwood trees because it's perennial. And in the bottom part are orange sycamores because that's more flashy on Muggy Own Creek. Muggion Creek is uh, ephemeral, so it, it doesn't have the cottonwoods, which again have to have their toes in the water. And up above in the wilderness are the Gila Cliffs uh, National Monument, where the Muggion people resided, and pretty spectacular spot to visit with a commanding view. The birds are here, 
the American Cardinal, Northern Cardinal, Panapepla, endangered willow flycatcher, very endangered. Why? Because we've lost so much willow and cottonwood in this river system. Beaver are bank dwellers because if they build a lodge, it'll just get wiped out by the next, next flash flood. So they have holes in the banks. Quite a Monday in a desert hawthorn tree. And uh, the Gila always leaves you with a gift. I was there for a week on this particular autumn period and, and I hadn't seen the sandhill cranes. I saw them, I, I heard them every single day, but they were in pasture grass and they, they were hidden. And, and so it was, it was kind of maddening. I, I have these <laughs> kind of tearful goodbyes every time I leave a place and I'm saying goodbye to the river and going through this whole thing. And all of a sudden these cranes lifted off and they flew across that backdrop of cottonwood and sycamore and it was glorious. And yeah, I cried like a baby. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, then there's more cranes in the Sulphur Springs Valley below Wilcox, south of Wilcox. Beyond the border, there's about 40,000 cranes in winter. And these guys in whitewater draw are using flooded playa, what used, to, what used to hold water. So we have to flood, we have to use irrigation basically, so these guys have a place to roost because they have to stand in knee deep water in order to not get uh, eaten in the night by coyotes and such. So 25,000 cranes here. On the San Pedro, I was just with Holly Richter a couple days ago. Um, Holly is a hydrologist, brilliant person, was working for a TNC, the Nature Conservancy at the time. Um, now she's doing some work at Fort Huachuca, which is totally dependent on the San Pedro River. So here we are on the San Pedro, just north of the border. It's one of only two rivers in the watershed that flow south to north across the Mexican border. And right here, you're looking at the water table. So 40 years of unfettered groundwater pumping has pulled this river down so much that there's about 60% dry patches and 40% wet patches. The whole, the whole Sierra, or Sierra Vista Valley plus Fort Huachuca depend on this river. It's really important that we get it right. It's hemispherically important for birds. And what Holly has done is she started, built a community and started a program to infiltrate water into the alluvial aquifer underneath the river and to raise the water table. So there's water for birds and other wildlife and also for people. So uh, I have a camera, <laughs> that I, a perfectly good camera that I left in a tree on the border in August because Holly asked me, well, you know, how, how, is there any way to time lapse the monsoon events when they come? These really intense uh, storms that bring lots of moisture, about 60% of the annual moisture to this region. I said, I don't know, but I know people, and I work with the Platte Basin Time Lapse, and I went to my friends at Platte Basin Time Lapse, and Jeff built me a box, and that little bubble is a rain gauge, so it speeds up the frames per hour if it senses rain. And this is just a snippet of what it looks like, and what you'll see is the channel fills up, and then it drains very, very quickly. This is just very early footage. Fills up, there it drains. Now it's raining at night, fills up, and there it goes. So the water disappears in about a day and a half, and where does it go? Right into the alluvial aquifer. If there are multiple rain events, say in a week, then, that, then the groundwater table is higher, and so there's, the surface water stays for longer. And I'm gonna leave that camera out there for a year and we'll see what a whole hydrological cycle looks like. Um, it's running on two giant batteries. How do I keep it going? It's got two brick batteries. Because you're in a cottonwood gallery forest, you can't have a solar panel, plus there's, there's migrant traffic and, and border patrol traffic through there. So it's gotta be kind of conspicuous, thus the 3D camo. And um, it also can't automatically upload, so I can't have a modem in the box. So I have to physically go down there and change cards and charge batteries. But I get to hang out with some friends. It's all good. The original groundwater pump before the centrifugal pump. And these guys are getting dried out because there's big cheese factories and big water users that are drilling deeper and deeper and deeper. And when I first visited the wall, um, which is 
it's weird. You go through the National Riparian Conservation Area, which is gloriously beautiful, and then you hit the wall. And the first time I was there, it was those X-shaped bollards that were only about waist high, so animals could cross. But now there's this, and it's, mo it's a monstrosity. I don't know how tall it is. It's taller than 30 feet, and it's the narrower slats, so not even a turtle or a rabbit can get through it. Um, jaguars can't get through it. Ocelots can't get through it. So um, even though there's tremendous wildlife richness on the San Pedro, it could be so much better if animals had freedom to roam. <clears throat> the birds are here, the Gila woodpecker in the, in the floodplain, yellow-breasted chat, lots and lots of birds. Um, beautiful place to go up on Coronado Peak in Coronado National Memorial and look out over the, board, the international border and, and the San Pedro floodplain and you're up on this giant grassland um, at sunset, just really gold and spectacular. <clears throat> and as you go in the Sky Island Mountains, there's 50 some Sky Island ranges. There's different biomes as you go up in elevation and with unique species, unique, pl unique plant and animal species. One of those is the coos deer, which are about waist high. They're an elfin white-tailed deer relative with amazing eyelashes. With a backdrop of big tooth maple and cottonwood, really gorgeous. You can see the deciduous trees coming out of the Huachuca Range lining Ramsey Creek. The Grand Canyon. <laughs> So I, I went to the Grand Canyon, I flew over it pretty much for this picture. The little blue line <clears throat> or artery is the Little Colorado River, excuse me, <clears throat> is the Little Colorado River. And in darkness, in the shadow, is the Colorado. So the confluence is down there at the bottom and it's a sacred confluence. It's the birthplace of the Hopi people. It's the current homeland of the Navajo Diné people. And it's sacred to all of the tribes with connection to this region. And initially there was to be a big development on the, the mesa to the lower left called the Escalade development. And that's why I flew over this because at the time it was, it was a really hot issue. And it was gonna run a gondola down to the river and uh, pretty much destroy this sacred place. But the Navajo people stopped it. So it's wild and free for good and still sacred. And I've done several raft trips on this journey with Audubon Rockies. This is my friend, Allison Holleran. She w wrote a wonderful migration piece about bird migrations for the book. We had a couple of guest writers. And uh, Allison is instrumental in these raft trips that we go on. Here's Abby Burke, always with a permagrin anytime she's on the river. I lost track of how many kayaks Abby has. Um, but together, these two amazing ladies run these raft trips. Abby is all things Western River Conservation for Audubon, and I'm going to see her next week in Las Vegas. We'll see, we'll see Abby, and um, yeah, she's a, a great human being doing great work. This is on our Yampa trip, which was when I really got hooked in 2016. B.J. Boyle calls the Grand Canyon the real world. The rest of this is all the unreal world. He's done 220-some river trips. Lots of lore and connections through your river guides. The thing I like about river guides is they can be a PhD or a high school dropout, but the common bond is the river, and somehow the river just picks these people. You know, it's super cool. Uh, and there's nothing like floating through these walls of time, right? So sacred. To visit the confluence, what we looked at from up above, to be at river level, next to that turquoise blue water that comes from calcium carbonate that, uh, uh, of an upriver up um, stream, <clears throat> to peer into a slot canyon, Deer Creek slot. The side canyons photographically are, are where it's at in the Grand Canyon, just, just magical. California condors are doing better. Um, last year was a little tough on the Southern Cal, or rather, I guess it's Northern California um, birds. Anyway, there was a West Nile breakout and we lost some birds. But um, last year, for the first time since 
the captive breeding program started, there were more birds in the wild than in captivity. So they're making improvements. Still, their number one cause of mortality is from lead bullets, um, you know, preying on carcasses that have been shot with a lead bullet. And the funny thing is, is copper is readily available, and oftentimes the copper ammunition is free to kind of wean people off of the lead bullets. It's just been a hard sell. This is my wife, Marla, on the rim of Grand Staircase Escalante. At the start of the pandemic, um, Marla was diagnosed with cancer, with liposarcoma, which was a bad diagnosis. It's the most aggressive and one of the rarest of cancers. And man, she fought hard. She fought through really hard chemo treatments. And uh, she regained all of her strength and had clean scans in 2021 and was doing incredible. And on January 1st, 2021, we resumed our tradition of hiking up on snowshoes in the dark in the headwaters and getting above timberline and uh, welcoming sunrise of a new year and going to look for white-tailed ptarmigan. And I wish I could leave the story there. But the cancer came back. And there were more surgeries and complications. And Marla never for a second gave up hope. Um, and that's a big part of what keeps me going. So we lost Marla in May of 2022. She was my light. She was joy and kindness and generosity and love. She was the glue that held our family together. And um, so I just try to carry on and give tribute to her in, in my daily life. And thanks for giving me the space to share Marla with you. <clears throat> so now what do you do? Marla's mantra was just got to keep going. She would have expected me to finish this project. And she loved this project. She's, she's the reason I was able to go full time as a photographer. She supported every half-baked idea I ever had. And I had to finish. And yet I had not been to the Colorado River Delta in Mexico. I couldn't write the chapter because I hadn't been there. So I asked Jennifer Pitt if I could interview her. She's VP of Audubon, 30 plus years in the Colorado River Delta, instrumental in the restoration work that's going on now. Jennifer added texture and grit and community and, and story that I could not have, gave an incredible interview that became our chapter. And I'm mightily grateful. And then I went to the Delta. I flew over it with Lighthawk, who does all my flights. And on the left side is Yuma Lettuce, and then there's the border, and then you see the Colorado River coming in, hits the Morelos Dam, gets shunted off to Mexicali Agriculture, and there's that little trickle left in the floodplain. And that's why you hear that the Colorado River dries up in the sands of Mexico. But that's not the whole story. We can do better. We can tell nuanced stories, like of Siena de, de Santa Clara, which was created by a leaky pipe on the U.S an ag pipe on the U.S. side that leaked for years and filled up this giant wetland that now looks like what the Colorado River Delta used to look like with a labyrinth of lagoons. <clears throat> we can go to the restoration sites where the Raise the River Alliance, this is Pro Natura Nareste. The funny thing is I called them in July and said I'd like to come down and Mary, or, um, Mary Lou's boss said, uh, uh, Dave, we've never had anybody ask to come down here in July. It's the hottest place in Mexico. <laughs> and it, it lived up to that. Um, but Mary Lou's got a, a uh, cottonwood tree, and Dylan's got a willow, and they grow all the plants that belong in these riparian areas. And with just a tiny bit of water, they're restoring these sites. And I asked Mary Lou, what brought you to this? And she, when she was 14 years old, in 2014, there was the pulse flow of the Colorado River where we sent a large volume of water down the river to reach the sea again. It was an environmental experimental flow. It ran for two months. And in that time, she visited the river every day and fell in love with the river and decided to work in river conservation. The river picked her. And she's this amazing person. 
And this is what a restoration site looks like in the beginning in the Colorado River floodplain. And then it gets bulldozed and the, the invasive plants get removed and they start, they bring in water and, and the plants that are supposed to be there and they use less than 1% of the historic flow, but they're doing incredible work in restoring sites like Chaucy. And now the birds, the 18 million birds that can cross the Colorado River Delta, they can stop in these sites as they work their way north, like the Miguel Alleman site that 10 years ago, when they scraped it clean, had 23 bird species. 10 years later, now a mature site with mature cottonwood and willow and all the other plants, it went from 23 bird species to 123 bird species. Pretty, pretty great results. And the Raise the River Alliance is on both sides of the border, conservation groups. And boy, are they serious about helping the river to reach the sea again. So when I look at this image, I think of it as the Colorado River trying to reach the sea. I know it's the tidal flats, and it's not really the river where steamboats used to carry goods and people. And I look at this frame, and I think, Man, that's like the river is just reaching for the sea, right? We can do this. Is there hope for the Colorado River? You're darn right. There's hope for the Colorado River. There's a lot of hope in these river keepers who have built communities to protect their parts of the watershed. You know, and, and there's great work going on everywhere in the watershed. Where water flows, there is life. And I think we have to look at this through a hopeful lens. Decision makers are going to do what they do uh, with the allocations. And I feel like there's a big gap between policy and between the 40 million of us in our understanding of the moment that we're in. Are we ready to tear out our lawns yet? Probably not. But the thing is, we can look to these folks doing great work for inspiration. And for us, remember that story about Mary Lou Maldonado, how she, the river picked her? Well, she went to the river. We got to go to the river. We got to go to the river and be present with her and let the river soak into us. And in those, in those moments, we can take that away and, and hold that with us forever. And, and, and if, we, if we go to the river and we ask the question, well, where's my water come from? And we go there, virtually is okay. We go to that mountaintop. That starts a process of discovery where we want to know where the water goes and who it uses and who uses the water and who's our downstream neighbors. We start to ask those questions and we start to become the river. And if enough of us do that, we become the river as a watershed community. Rivers change people. And that's the moment that we're in. Become the river. Speak for her. We are the Colorado River. Thank you. Have they fixed the leaky pipe? I, <laughs> I, I don't know, but um, there's still water flowing into Siena de, de Santa Clara, and it's recognized as an incredibly important place for birds and other wildlife. Yeah. It's pretty striking. To, you're in a plane, and you come upon that when you're looking at miles and miles of barren desert, seemingly barren, um, and then you see all that life down there. It's, it's wild stuff. Sure, what kind of camera equipment do I use? So I set, I shot almost all of this with Nikon equipment. Um, there's some GoPro pictures in there. There's maybe a cell phone picture or two in there. There's the, the fish beneath the water. That was crazy because I had a, mono, a GoPro on a monopod and then I, that wasn't, I was too close. The fish were fleeing. So then I found a surveyor's stake and taped that on and that was too close. And I ended up with a thing that was from me to you, like in the river like this, to try to make those pictures. So um, a lot of whatever it takes, some camera traps, um, aerial stuff, a variety of things. I've since switched to Sony, but it doesn't matter um, what gear you use. All the gear is good, you know. Um, Full-time photographers tend to, you know, focus on the 5% of the time when you're in extreme low light, which were, is where a lot of the good pictures come from. So thanks. You got a
Yeah, uh, you had mentioned the Gila River was one of two wild flowing rivers in the American Southwest. And I was trying, trying to think what the other one might be. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so, you know, that's, that's a little squishy, but really it's the San Pedro and it's the Gila in the Southwest. You know, you could throw the Santa Cruz in there, but Santa Cruz is more dry than it is wet. That's a little tough. Um, you know, basically all these rivers have diversions on them and, and impoundments. And, um, you know, that just uh, disrupts life. It's hard. How am I thinking about my landscapes as I make these pictures? Um, do I think of the river as a character always? Uh, my indigenous friends taught me that it's a female river, so I like attaching that gender to the river. I think that's elegant. Um, most of the pictures are made from an idea that comes before I arrive in a place, and so I come with a number of ideas, and rarely does it all line up to where you're making the picture that you had in your head exactly. But having that framework enables, gives me the space to, you know, to be present and to, to try to make the picture in my mind, which comes from an idea. So ideas are pictures, pictures are stories, and that's, you know, and eventually the cool thing that happens with a multi-year story is you get to a place where there's a nexus. And at that nexus, the story starts to decide what pictures you're going to make. And that's the drug. That's the crack in this whole thing that really pulls you in. Like, okay, now the story's in charge. I don't even have to, I can just hold on. And it's, it's super cool that way. So, um, yeah, but all the pictures come from ideas. And I think if you're a photo photographer, um, it, it's good to get to a place where you're thinking in terms of story. Um, that's how we really bring people along on our journeys. And, um, and yeah, from that comes the ideas that become the photographs. Thank you. Do I, can I think of a time or a place where the river really called me or pulled me in? Where you became a, a, a river person. Where I became a river person, yeah. I would say there, that's a really great question I've never had before, and I appreciate it very much. <laughs> I really do. I would say there were a couple of points. <clears throat> One was the initial raft trip on the Yampa River. Um, the, the idea of moving at the pace of a great river and getting to that point where your rhythms are matched with the pace of the river, that was, that was really something. Um, being on the Gila, uh, I like to go to places where nobody else is photographing, you know, and find my own stories and find my own stuff. And being on the Gila and, and just being in the magic, there's an aura to that place that's indescribable. Um, that, was, that was really powerful for me. Going to the bottom of Black Canyon of the Gunnison where the river talks because it's so constricted and it's working its way through giant boulders and it's only 40 feet wide. And literally you're, you're going, what? Um, so a lot of those things added up. And then working with the indigenous folks um, and just absorbing the sacredness of it all and internalizing that sacredness to a, to a point where it, it's just unshakable, you know. So thank you very much for that question. Be happy to sign some books. Thank you very much. Dave, that was remarkable. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was, you told your story, the, the story, so beautifully and showed us uh, the, the beautiful photography you've done. So um, that was amazing. Thank you, thank you so much. And learn something about San Diego water. There you go, right? <laughs> we got some experts here. <laughs> thank you. And this season of giving, um, I think you have to all think about the San Diego River Park Foundation. Uh, so there's number, there's number maybe number one, you know, right there along with it. Dave's has got his book for sale. They've been out since, I guess, April, from what I understand. So um, he's going to be selling them here, and uh, I'm guessing you'll sign it as well. A little added bonus, so thank you for that. 
Uh, and also, just of course, encourage you all to check out Adventure16.com and in the season of giving, you might find uh, some fun stuff. You're not going to find any gear there, but you might find some things that, uh, that will help inspire you and, and, and uh, help you remember. So thank you all. It wouldn't be nearly as much fun if you didn't have all of you come tonight. So thank you so much and uh, have a great holiday season.